Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another Microsoft Flight Simulator video. It's a bit of a departure for me today. I don't really have a lot of experience with amphibians, but I was really attracted to this one and I wanted to give it a go. It's actually a freeware add-on module of the Grumman Goose. Now, like I said, I'm no expert in this kind of aircraft, but there also aren't a whole lot of other videos out there about it. Um, so I thought maybe we could learn something together. So let's have a look. Okay, here we are in the cockpit. Now, let me just get some switches thrown to get us started up here. There is no manual, but I think I've figured it out. First, we need some switches down here, which are the battery and the fuel boost pump and the generators and that sort of thing. And then maybe I uh, want to turn on a few lights and the master avionics. And I think that's all we need to get her started up. Now we get to look up here. Uh, not generating anything yet. Oops, I got my flaps down. I don't really want them down at this point. That's probably just my my controller setting. So we'll take the flaps up uh, for startup. Uh, pull back on the power. we got to turn our magnetos on. Two of them. And I think we're ready. So let's... Uh, are we ready? Yes, clear. Okay, make sure the throttles are cracked just a little. Get the RPMs all the way back to minimum, starting the right engine. Going, so let's start the left engine. All right, I think we're started up. Now, it does seem to be a little trick with the goose that you want to make sure you get those oil lights to go off. Uh, if you keep the throttle pulled back too far, I find that the engines will stop on you. I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff is, but not having any lights on on the dashboard seems to be a good thing. If there's anybody out there who knows a little bit more about the actual specs, you could let us know. And I'm just going to taxi out to the runway. So we're going to do a little bit of flying today. Might as well get off the ground and we can talk a little bit more about the model once we get up there. I think you can see from the introduction, it really uh, it's a beautiful livery, RCAF. I'm not sure that the Goose actually ever flew in the RCAF, but it sure looks good in those colors. Now it is a tailwheel aircraft, and it does taxi pretty quickly, so ground handling is something you have to take reasonably carefully. But it does have a tailwheel lock as well. Um, I've bound that to a switch because I couldn't find it anywhere in the cockpit, but you definitely want to enable that before you start your takeoff run. And um, you want to be fairly easy on the brakes, or that happens, because it is a, a tail dragger. So, okay, well, we're just letting the engines uh, warm up a little, here a little more. I'll just say a little bit more about the Goose. You'll notice that we are starting on the runway. This is Campbell River. Welcome to beautiful British Columbia. Um, I decided to do a ground takeoff because the one part of the model that I do have a little bit of trouble with is its water handle. I didn't want to start talking about uh, an issue with the model, uh, so I figured we would start uh, taking off from, from an airport because it is an amphibian and it's capable of doing that as well. So uh, I think it's just about time to get this show on the road. Just pushing the throttles up a little here. Let the brakes go. And we're off. Tail comes up pretty easily, and then we can get the uh, power all the way up. Uh, like a lot of tail draggers, it's a little sensitive to rudder. It takes a little bit of getting used to. And I'm not quite there yet, but it gets off the ground pretty easily, actually. Now we have the gear up, and we're getting the flaps up, and we're off. So what attracted me to the Goose, honestly, was that was I really uh, did want to uh, do some flying in uh, float planes or, or amphibians in Microsoft Flight Simulator is one of the things that I was really looking forward to. But all of the stock aircraft in, uh, that have floats are really slow. Uh, I think the fastest uh, cruise speed amongst them is a shade under 120 miles an hour. So I wanted to find something a little faster, and I took a look around. 
found the Goose uh, on uh, as freeware and decided to give it a try. And as you can see, it really is a very attractive uh, model. Um, I like this livery, but it, it, there are plenty of other liveries available for the Goose. And uh, the thing I found that really um, I liked about it was that it has a cruising speed, you know, between 180 and 190 miles an hour. If you don't care about uh, fuel efficiency that all that much, and it climbs out pretty well as we're flying here, so it, it really is possible to uh, cover some ground in the Goose. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we've taken off from the Campbell River Airport. We're going to fly past the Campbell River Seaplane Base. I'm going to fly down the south side of that island where you see the uh, uh, airport uh, CAG9. We're going to come around the north side and then do a downwind leg and land there. So that's, uh, that's our little flight plan for today. Um, and you can see that uh, you know we're moving out uh, fairly well right now. Um, so I have tried um, a little bit um, trying to find out what the best settings are um, for manifold pressure and RPMs. Um, and uh, right now we're set to fairly close to maximum just because I want to see what the maximum cruise performance is but uh, maybe we'll take a little bit of look at, at what the effect of juggling those uh, the two controls are as we do a little bit more flying so now we get rid of the map now now it's a good time to take another, another external look uh, it really is very attractive aircraft looks very at home in this setting I think Yeah, and you can see we're flying over Campbell River. The cockpit is also pretty well done. Um, definitely gives one the feeling of a 1940s uh, uh, handmade cockpit, which it really was. Uh, very few Grumman Goose were actually produced, something like about 350, I think, and they were all basically handmade. Um, and it certainly gives that impression um, when you're sitting in the cockpit. So. It uh, gives you a nice feeling of uh, old wooden leather um, and, and really um, kind of looks and feels like a vintage aircraft, which I really like as well. So now you can see that with uh, the manifold pressure dialed up to about 25 and the uh, RPMs at about 22, 2300, which is fairly close to the top of the range, uh, we're managing a little bit under 180 miles an hour here, which is a pretty good clip. Now, I have not experimented with the autopilot, so I'm not even really sure how functional that is, whether there's anything implemented. Um, it's a reasonably relaxing aircraft uh, to fly once you get it trimmed out, which takes a little bit of experimentation. Um, but once you get it trimmed out, it doesn't require a whole lot of control input, so it can be reasonably relaxing um, to fly. And it's pretty stable in the air. Um, let's face it, it's not the most uh, sprightly of aircraft. Um, so, uh, you know, you can, you can be reasonably relaxed on the controls and do some sightseeing while you're flying around, as we're doing here right now. So, as you can see, we're reasonably level at 3,000 feet. We've, uh, um, you know, we've settled into a cruise at about 170 miles an hour. And we're going down the south side uh, of this island. We're going to swing around the north and then come in for a landing. So I also like the sound modeling. Um, the sound of those two um, radial engines is definitely uh, impressive and a very vintage quality. Maybe a little bit less impressed with the exterior sounds, but uh, inside the cockpit um, certainly is a great, uh, a great soundscape. As you can see, the instrument set is uh, pretty basic. I'm not doing any navigation here today, but maybe in a future video we can take a look at using the nav instruments and check that they work. Um, but other than that, it's your, pretty much your regular set of steam gauges here. And then up uh, in the center you have the engine gauges and uh, there are some overhead gauges as well, but not ones you really need to check during flight. So let's see what happens if we cut the engine back. So we're cutting the manifold pressure now down to about 20 inches, which is at the low end of the cruise range.
But we're also going into a little bit of a shallow dive here as we come down along the, uh, to around the headland here and go back uh, around to, uh, to take a look at our landing site. So uh, even in a shallow dive, we're doing 180 miles an hour with the, with the manifold pressure set to 20. We're leveling out here. I'm turning that back up a little bit. So, uh, as per usual in Microsoft Flight Simulator, the, uh, the scenery really is impressive. And just a beautiful place to spend a nice summer sunny day. So we're headed for the Surge Narrows seaplane base uh, that you see over to the left of the cockpit there. We're just going to come around this uh, one large hill and then we're going to do a downwind uh, on the far side of uh, the seaplane base. As you can see it's uh, very docile. Um, you know it flies uh, a little bit like a bus um, because that's what it is. I do find one thing uh, that does require a lot of rudder uh, which is maybe more typical of airplanes of, it, of its era than, than uh, a lot of modern aircraft. In fact, I have a lot of curvature programmed into my rudder um, because I find the ground handling a little twitchy like a lot of tail draggers. But um, because of that, I do actually have to use an awful lot of rudder to stay coordinated in the turns. And the artificial horizon is a little small, um, and I find myself consulting the vertical speed indicator to find out if I'm in level flight really more than, uh, than the artificial horizon. It's just, uh, at least at this resolution, it's just not fine enough to tell me when I'm level. Uh, it's probably well modeled, it's just with uh, uh, the resolution uh, of the graphics. Uh, I can't really use it to tell whether I'm perfectly level. So we're just going into a left turn here. Now we're going to fly a downwind and take a look at the landing site. And we're dropping the altitude down slowly as we do that. So there's the seaplane base there, so we're kind of going to want to uh, fly in and touch down somewhere around that promontory that's sticking out. Uh, again, I, I don't know a lot about flying seaplanes, but what I have picked up is that uh, you basically the basic standard procedure is to kind of fly around the landing site, pick your touchdown spot, and then envision your final leg back from that. So I'm looking at that other promontory coming out from uh, the right hand side there. That looks like we'll want to go over the edge of that aimed at that little promontory and that'll give us uh, a good setup for our final. So uh, let's go down this side. Now we got, don't want to get all the way down to a thousand feet like a standard downwind, I don't think. But it's a little bit high hills here to do that. So we'll just start to slow down now at this altitude. Here's a good sight of the landing area behind us. Now, one thing we do want to do is get our floats down uh, because they fold up into the tips of the wing. So uh, once we get slow enough here, I'm not sure what the speed at which you can put them down is. I've certainly flown with them at faster speeds than this. I don't know if there's a maximum speed. I think uh, we're pretty sure we're slow enough now. Yeah, we're getting down under 120 miles an hour, so let's get the floats down. Really interesting sounds of those coming down. Alright, so got the floats down, we'll also put the flaps all the way down. And we'll start turning on our base leg, because we're past that point that we picked out as kind of the, uh, the initial point for our final. So we're well past that, so let's... Uh, Let's turn in here. Again, I'm not sure what the speeds are supposed to be. Uh, with flaps down, certainly approaching at 80 miles an hour is not uncomfortable. Um, so we're going to try and keep it between about 80 and 90 probably on final. A little bit more power because we're dropping a little fast. Now again, I, I'm no expert, but the approach that I'm trying to take here in flying this approach is to uh, come down um, almost like a normal approach, but as we get closer to the water um, to gradually reduce the sink rate until we're just skimming the water and then um, 
we'll just basically decide the point at which we want to touch down and we'll cut the power at that point and sink uh, right into the water. So now we're lining up on final. And we're probably a little low. Gonna keep the power up here till we get over that headland. Don't need to get uh, too low over the trees. Once I'm sure we're clear of that, we back off the power a little bit, let the nose come down. Get down closer to the water and then um, like I said, we'll add a little bit of power as we get closer so we reduce the sink rate. We don't really want to drop into the water at too high a sink rate, I don't think. So uh, we'll let her come down pretty quickly here and then we'll pick up the nose with some power. Once we're sure we're into our landing zone. Uh, and it is um, an airplane of its era. The engines uh, are not as responsive as maybe modern engine, so you do have to think a little bit ahead to stay ahead of the curve. I think we're uh, pretty good now, so sink rate is coming down, it's under 500 now. Just add a little bit more power here, and bring the nose up slightly, and now we're just above the water and almost level, and as we get closer to that point, we're just going to decide to let it drop in. And there we are. Safe and wet, as the uh, saying goes. Okay, so as we're coming to a stop here, let me just uh, talk a bit about the gorilla in the room, uh, which is the water handling. And, and I don't know if the water handling is really has much to do with the model as much as it has to do with the way Microsoft Flight Simulator handles uh, the water physics. But the fact of the matter is that you really um, have no control, directional control at all, unless the aircraft is up on a plane like this, which happens, um, you know, about 30 miles an hour or so, I'm going to say. So when you let the aircraft get slower than that, you really lose all ability to point the nose. Um, and so this can be a little frustrating when you, particularly when you start on the water, because you have to get moving pretty quickly to be able to turn if you're not turned in the right direction you're too close to the, the shore, then that's going to be an issue. So um, that that is one thing that I find I struggle with a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution to that is. If there's anybody out there that knows, um, you could let me know. But other than that, I really enjoy this model, and I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And for now, this is going to be Sidekick, signing off.